In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we come to your word. Your word, which is truth and life to those who find it. <coughs> Lord, it's your truth of your word that sets us free, that heals our lives, our bodies. It's a lamp to our feet. Lord, we pray that your word would go deep into our hearts. And when we need it most, you will bring it to life, not only for us, but for others. Lord, you've come to set the captive free. And today we ask you, Lord, for that, your delivering power on the lives of those who are in the hearing of this word. For we ask these things, Father, in Jesus' name, we ask and pray. Amen. Amen. If you're watching this for the first time by video, our name is Pastor Michael Staub. This is Way of New Life Ministries, and you can find us on the web at wayofnewlifeministries.org. And today we're going to be dealing with a couple of scriptures. The first one comes from John 18, 7. And to give you some background, this is the place where Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, where we read about, it's called the Agony of the Garden. It's a place where the Father is asking him to go to the cross. And that's gonna be the subject today for us, is how do we deal with our crosses in our life? And when you look at Jesus' example, so I want to start to read by John 18, 7. And this comes on the heels of Jesus. When he goes into the garden, we read about how he is very sorrowful, even unto death, that he's very heavy. And these are one of the aspects in our lives when we start to talk about the cross. So let me read John 7 first. This is when they come to grab Jesus, and it says, Then asked he them again, Whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. So I want to also read Matthew 26, 38. And that reads, Then saith he unto them, this is Jesus, as they go into the garden, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. When we read this account of Jesus going into the garden, He tells his disciples, he says, I'm going to go beyond her and pray. And he takes Peter, James, and John with him. And he asks them to pray for him as he goes beyond those three. And this heaviness, the reality of this cross coming upon Jesus at the Father's asking him to carry. He's very much aware of what is about to come. It's not just the physical anguish that he has to address, the knowledge of going to the cross, but it's also the mental anguish, the spiritual anguish that goes along with this cross that God has asked, the Father's asking him to carry. So much is the heaviness of this that we see the, the humanity of Christ coming to light with this struggle. And we see him coming to the disciples three different times, asking for this support. And see, in our lives, crosses can take on different types of structures, different types of situations in our life. It can be a mental cross. And I don't know if you've ever lived in a place where you've lost your peace and 
you feel like you're on the verge of a nervous breakdown, maybe having panic attacks or anxiety attacks. And if you're living in a place like that, that can be a prison in itself, a mental prison. You can't enjoy life as it was meant to be because of all this stress that's in your life. And you're not sure on how to get rid of it. It can also be coupled with spiritual oppression, you know, demonic oppression. And then there's other types of crosses where it's a physical cross, where you're given a diagnosis, a sickness, where you're, you're debilitated, to where you can't do things the way you normally would do them. You're bedridden. You have to go through us, and it's something that's with you. And how do we know what a cross is? A cross, when it comes, we look for ways to get around of it. None of us want to suffer. None of us want the anguish. We're looking for what we were made to live in, which is the joy and peace of life that God meant us to live in. It started all the way back in the Garden of Eden when things were perfect until mankind sinned and they were, they were extracted from the garden. And by the sweat of their brow and by the pain of childbirth, we entered into this world of choices. We have a free will and God will never take that from you. You're gonna make thousands of choices. You're gonna make a choice whether to watch the Steelers tonight or not and whether you're going to stay up late to see the end, no matter how they do. You're going to make a choice whether you're going to go out to lunch or whether you're going to take a nap, which I only start taking naps recently. I'm 70 years old. I never took naps before. Naps are great if you can do, get a nap. We have choices. Maybe to call a friend or someone that you know needs some upliftment. My grandson who just had an operation, he's an athletic basketball and he just tore his LCU, I think it's called, or whatever that term is. And I know he's laid up, I'm gonna try to go visit him today. Sometimes it's the Lord, the Holy Spirit puts on our hearts, you know, things that we can do for others. And we have choices whether we're going to do that or not. And certainly Jesus had a choice when the cross came upon him, that deep burden. The word says that there was so much anguish and so much resistance to this evil that he sweated blood as he was dealing with this stress, not, not to sin or not to find a way to overcome it. And we look for that in life. And sometimes we can overcome our crosses by our efforts. I call them small crosses because maybe we can get someone to help us and we can overcome it within our own means, okay? But a true cross or a big cross is a cross you can't do anything with. It's going to come in your lap. It might be uh, an unexpected death in the family. It might be unexpected financial difficulties that you have no control over. It could be the stock market crashes tomorrow. It could be your country's invaded by Russia, like Ukraine. And you're thrust into this, this war. Or it could be Israel, what they're dealing with, and the Palestinians. It can be choices of other people. We have a government that we live in this land that we live, and we have to deal with what this land is. And such was the case with Jesus. And although he tried to find a way around that cross as we recognize his deliberation with the Father when he's in his prayer, the three times he's like, Father, if there's another way, is there another way around this cross? Can I go over this mountain another way or tunnel through it or go around it? 
And he goes back to the Father three times looking for another way because this cross was brutal. And sometimes we're going to face this brutality in our lives. We might be dealing with a broken marriage in our lives where we're not hitting it off, but we're living with the person. Maybe we've been through one or two divorces in our life. Maybe we've been expelled from our family or rejected because of who we are, because of our political preferences. <laughs> or maybe it's a physical situation where suddenly we're very active, but now we're bedridden. And there's nothing the doctors can do. I've experienced many different things in my life. I've seen it. I've seen children that have been bedridden through their whole life operate in a wheelchair with their mouth. If you want to talk about something that will take complacency out of your life, go visit a nursing home and see what some people, people that are blind from birth. I remember I used to go out and minister to these different places when I was a student preacher. And I walked into this one nursing home and I, and I didn't have our guitarist with you. We used to do a short service. And she couldn't make it. So it was this us to have a service. And as I walked into the assembly room, there was, I heard the piano being played, all great thou art. And as I entered in, it was this elderly lady playing the piano. And I waited for her to finish, she played very well. And I approached her and I said, I introduced myself and I said, would you mind playing for our service today? I listened to you play and it was very wonderful. And she started to cry. She said, I've been blind from birth. I've learned to play the piano and I wanted to play in our church, but they wouldn't let me. And it meant such a big thing for her to be able to play for some type of church service. And that just blessed me so much when we start to see the crosses that some people have to bear. And we recognize also how blessed we are. But crosses will come. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. We have an adversary, a devil. There's good and evil. We're dealing in a world where there's a war going on between good and evil. Certain things you call good, people in the world don't call good. Some people call abortions as being good because it gives them sexual freedom to do whatever the hell they want. They think they have a right to destroy that baby. They call it good. They call you evil when you stand up for life that that woman in that womb or that young man has a right just as much as they do to live. And where in the heck did they come from anyways? And what gives them the right to destroy a life? The, third, the, the fifth commandment says, thou shalt not kill. And we live in this type of a world. We see lawlessness and many times that's called good. And what really is good? And what is truth? And these are the things we faced in this world that we live. Because there's a certain part of this world that's godless. We read about it in the Word. If you want to really find truth, you read about how man follow, mankind follows the imagination of his hearts. He thinks by getting a sex change, things are going to be different than if he becomes a feminine rather than a masculine or vice versa. That that's gonna make a change. Not accepting the sex that God made them. Not accepting God's will in their lives that, you know, with being sexually active, there are consequences. You could get pregnant because God meant that not only to have pleasure in a marriage, but also to bring forth new life. And if you're going to try to erase that as to what God's order is, well, go out and keep having sex and see if you don't get pregnant. If you think the sun's not going to come up tomorrow morning because you think it should be different, 
good luck because that's God's order. The sun's coming up tomorrow and it's going to set at its time. Perfect timing. God's timing is perfect. Nature's in perfect order. The animal kingdom's in perfect order. Mankind is not in perfect order because of choice. He gives you a free will. We live in a valley of decision. And you will choose where you end up when you die. You're going to choose whether you go to hell or whether you go to the kingdom with him. He's not going to put you there. You're going to choose it. You're either going to reject the love of God and his ways or you're going to accept it throughout your life. Getting back to the cross, sometimes when crosses come, people will abandon God. They'll think that God let them die. It might be a premature death, a young marriage. Suddenly, the man has an accident and he dies and they get mad at God. Not realizing that there's choices. God doesn't stop someone from going to a bar and drinking themselves into oblivion and getting behind a wheel and going out and plowing into a family and killing them. It's choice. God doesn't stop a country from invading another country because they, they're greedy and they want all the resources and what have you. It's choice. It's choice. Can God intervene? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he can, and, and sometimes he does. But that's a sacred thing that he's given to man, his choice, and he rarely interferes with it. Rarely interferes with it. But when you align your choice with his, great things happen. And that's what happened to Jesus when he faced his cross. Imagine sweating blood. Imagine being sorrowful unto death. The heaviness of that, what he was to face. And then something happened. And I want to read to you Luke 22:42. Saying, Father, if thou will, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. You see, we can run away from crosses. We can fall off the map of life, which I've seen people do. They get mad at God. They go into depression. They're unable to function normally. Or they run to the bars and they're going to be a booze hon and get drunk all the time because they can't handle the pain. That's why you have so many drug addicts and so many alcoholics and so many sex fiends and pornography. And everyone's trying to accept, escape the pain of the cross. Which is a normal thing to want to do. But they go about it in a way that ends them up in a trap of making things worse. Jesus shows us in his word. He says, he comes to the place. He says, okay, I've tried asking you another way around this, but I realize I'm stuck with it. That's a true cross, a big cross. You can't do anything else about it except accept it. Accept it, and he said to carry it. He says, if you want to be my disciple, pick it up. What's that mean? That means taking care of that convalescent home person, your wife or your husband who suddenly became crippled in an early marriage and now you got to take care of him for the rest of your life like my father who at a later age had to get a feeding tube and we had to go down there every day give him a shower and i had two other brothers pitching in take care of his yard work wash his clothes give him these little microwave dinners every day and that went on for 10 years a cross. Were there times where I thought, gee, and I feel bad about it. I thought, Lord, just take him home. And I felt bad about that because it was costing me 
my selfishness. And I would catch myself like thinking, I, why would I think this is my dad who took care of me all these years? And I would repent of it. And when God finally took him, I was so happy that I spent the time to take care of him, to sacrifice my free time on the cross. Someone had to take care of him. And we can go down the line. I have a book out, it's called My Journey Trust in the Lord. You'll see it on the corner here. Or you can find it on Amazon or Barnes and Noble. It accounts for many different crosses in my life. When God called me to preach, he said, you'll lead many through the trials and tribulations of life. I had to go through them myself to be able to, to preach on them, to teach on them. And there's a great blessing when it comes to identifying your cross and accepting it. The cross has one purpose in mind for you to destroy the evil nature that tries to overtake your life, your selfish nature. It brings you out of yourself. You have to give of yourself. It'll strip you of every other element like money and whatever else you're trusting in life. It'll take you to a place where the only thing left you have to trust is him. Just like Jesus, when they came, for him, he said, now it's time. He, the first thing he had to do was face it. It's time. He said to his disciples, this is the hour of darkness. This is the hour I got to face my cross. And his disciples fled into the night. All his friends, all those he wanted to pray for him were sleeping and they fled. And that'll happen to you. You'll be, you'll feel like you're the only one. No one else understands what you're going through. It's you, it's God, it's the cross and the devil. And who's going to win? And this is where I want to read to you when, when, on verse 33. It says, after he said, not my will, but thine be done, something happened. And that's the key with every cross. When you accept it in the name of Jesus, when you say, Jesus, I'll do this for you, for my dad. I'll do this. I'll go the extra mile. I'll face this death that was suddenly in my house. This financial situation, I'll face it and I'll believe they're going to make a way for me to get through this. And how's that going to happen? Well, we read in 43, it says, and then there appeared an angel. This is after he said, not my will, but thine. Unto him from heaven, strengthening him. It wasn't until he said, my will be done. When he was wrestling to get out of it, there's your anguish. Not that you're not going to have any pain or suffering as you're going through it. But guess what? You're going to have a strengthening from God himself. That's going to enable you to persevere and get through to the end and actually have victory like Jesus had when he rose again from the dead. Sits at the right hand of the Father. And you can go through this Bible and find story after story of people in this word that faced the cross in their life. Joseph, who was, who was abandoned by his brothers, thrown into a pit, given to a foreign nation, <clears throat> thrown in prison ended up being second in command of Egypt and saving the country and his family from starvation. We don't understand why we have a cross. God's ways are not our ways. We're going to face circumstances. And it's important that we connect with him. <clears throat> it's important that we look to him and seek him for that strengthening to carry it. You can throw your cross away and go down in a bar and live there. You can go out in the streets Build a tent. Run away from reality. And don't think God can't get you out of yours because he can do all things. He got me out of mine. I lived under oppression. I lived under anxiety attacks. I haven't had an anxiety attack now since 1980. 
peace. And how did I get that peace? Well, I had the anxiety when I was running away from the calling that God called me to do, to preach. <clears throat> I didn't want that sacrifice. I ran, and he stripped me down. God's callings are without repentance. And I had a choice. I felt like I was ready to go nuts with the anxiety. If you've ever had an anxiety attack. I've had, I had a number of them. But one day I said, Lord, not your will, but mine. Not my will, but yours. Anything's better than this, this hell that I was going through mentally. I had a family, but they didn't recognize me. I was, I couldn't function. I'd skip out of work at noon and go sit in a church and just sit there, try to find some peace. I'd leave work early and grab a bottle of wine and go home and try. I was doing all kinds of things, trying to escape this pressure. But the moment I accepted God's will and said, not my will, yours, Lord, anything's better than this. The anxiety left. Here came the peace. I was halfway through my studies. I was in a book of Psalms. We had to summarize the Bible. It took me four years to get up to Psalms. In that last year, I finished the whole rest of the Bible and the rest of the curriculum, had my trial sermon, was ordained. The moment I said, my, not, your, not my will, but yours. Am I willing to clean a toilet for the Lord or to clean up some? When I had a death in the family and they were in hospice, I had to change their diaper. And that's not pleasant. Yeah, you'd want to get someone else to do it. But I did it for Jesus. When I went through financial struggles, and that's in the book, I did it for Jesus. And because when you do it for Jesus, it opens up a whole wide door of strength and grace and vision and direction. And you will come out on top and you will have a victory. There's a reason for the cross. There was a reason for Jesus' cross. There's a reason for Joseph's cross. There's a reason for David's cross. There's a reason for yours that you don't understand. Did David understand that he was going to be chased for 10 years by Saul for a reason? But he ended up on the throne, blessed out of his mind. Same with Joseph. Mary, who was crushed when he, she watched Jesus on the cross, a sword pierced her heart. But what happened when he rose from the dead? Can you imagine that reunion? You see, brothers and sisters, abundant life goes through the cross. He said, pick it up, face it. That's what Jesus did in John 7. He went and faced Judas and those that were coming for him. <clears throat> he told Peter to put his sword away. He said, this is something that I must do for the Father, for mankind. I have to go through this, and so do you. And you will come out closer to the Lord right now. And you've heard the stories. You've read it in a book where I was facing $186,000 in debt to the IRS that we accounted for and that we told them that we owed. A very stressful time. But God made a way for us to overcome all that. And when he did that, do you think I have stress over money after facing that? I saw God provide a way. And it wasn't playing the lottery. <clears throat> Paid that bill. I bought this diamond ring. It was only 90 bucks when I paid the last payment as a testimony to him of what he can do and there's other people involved in the business time and time again that he brought me through those times of suffering but I would not trade it for anything because why it brought me into a relationship with him <clears throat> what's the devil going to throw at me today is it death I went through death Lost my first wife. 
48 years old. She left me four children. I have 24 grandchildren now. And most of them, the older ones, are all saved. My children are saved. They all have good jobs. They're all prosperous. God has covered them. And then he led me, and I married Bonnie after 13 years of being a, a widower. Beautiful women. Both of them were homecoming queens. How do you like that? But there was a lot of suffering. And that wasn't first in my life. I waited 13 years because my youngest daughter was at home. I wasn't going to bring a woman in. You see, I put that where it belonged. And I put Christ first in his will. And when he opened up the door and said, okay, Mike, it's time if you want another woman, he said, I'll bring her to you. I was going to work and doing church. I was a assistant pastor. I didn't, I wasn't out in the clubs. I was going to go on Christian dating. He said, no, he says, I'll bring her to you. And then here comes Bonnie walking in, wanting to be immersed. <laughs> and then she wanted to have counsel. And then she started coming to all the meetings. And then we started to have a friendship and we started to go out. It's all in the book, how God did all that. He will never let you. Don't run away from your crosses because there's such a blessing behind it that you will not be able to contain. And I mean that, overflowing. I'm, I'm, on, a, I'm on a journey now. I have all my grandkids, they're all playing sports. And I probably went through 15 of them or 12 or 15 in the last two months trying to go to each game for at least one game for one of them. And I got three left. My, my uh, seventh grade grandson, who's actually taller than me, just won championship football for Charters Valley in his grade, in his grade bracket. Just over and over and over and over. God will bless you. Be willing to pay the price that he's asking you to pay. So let's pray. Lord, we can't do it without your strength. Jesus showed us that. He was he had to get that strength from the Father. Showing his humanity. Asking for prayers. When mankind let him down, his friends, his best friends let him down, all he had was you. And you never let him down. And neither will the Lord let you down in whatever your cross is. Whatever it is you're facing, he'll give you the grace to overcome it, to come into that victory, to come into peace, to overcome anxiety, to overcome medical situations, to cope with them, to cope with your age, to cope with broken relationships, divorces, children that are in prison, whatever it is that you're facing in life. Look to Jesus, seek him, and face that cross and ask for the strength that comes for you to overcome it, as Jesus overcome it. When he, lit, when he was on the cross, he overcame all darkness, all sin. He defeated the devil there, and he said, it's finished. And you know what? There's nothing greater than overcoming the devil in your life. When you go through the cross... What are they going to throw at you? Because you build a trust that is real. It becomes part of you. Because you know it's real and that he's alive. We thank you all for coming and I pray that whatever you face, and believe me, your life isn't always crosses. Our Christian life is valleys and mountaintops. Grow with the Lord and grow into that peace. Grow into his love. Grow into that abundant life that he has waiting for you. And know it's through the cross. That grace will allow you to die to your sinful nature and enter into that godly nature that you were made for. 
We ask all these things, Father, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for coming, and we hope you have a good day. Hey, I need your phone number before you head out. Oh, my number? <laughs>